Hey there friends, uh, teachers, welcome to School of Tomorrow, Oregon Curriculum Network. I'm going to do a little bit on how like schools opened for business 24-7, right? So I'm going to take school, and in this language game, there's like sunrise, sunset. It's like you can get your your license or something. You've got one of the big schools in town for a certain time that you can run it. Now by you, some entity that acquires the school, we'll talk about it. Because that sounds, you don't want the private sector controlling the public sector, right? So we'll talk about it. Anyway, Americana, I would say here we are in history class. We're learning about Oregon. We're learning place-based. And what does that mean actually? It means that the story you're telling either starts with you now and takes you to whatever venue. And you, everything's connected. So if it's history, you can do it. You know, even if you're going back to Neanderthal times, you can start from where we are now with a timeline. Then when you end the story, you bring it back to right, right where we are now, if you can do that. If we're sitting around a campfire in some place, and you can start your story by zooming out, and you can end your story by zooming in. See, so I tend to do that around here because I here meaning like Portland, Oregon, Asylum District. But I want to start bringing in all of world history and so on. How would I do that? And what would you do as a teacher? So get to thinking along these lines. And I'm giving you ideas because the big chunks I'm going to go over now, you can wire up to your place and time just as easily as I can to mine. And I'll show you how I do to me. And then think, how would you take Citizen Kane, one of the great movies ever made, so do you show films in your curriculum? Like my curriculum's all about watching movies and films and YouTubes and stuff, right? There's reading, but there's not just reading. Are you doing that? So you might be shocked, I say in this blog post, about how much I'm on on for film and stuff, you know, not, not just, okay, but it's still literature, it's still history. So here we've got Citizen Kane, everybody agrees it's a great film, but so is this documentary that on the two, two DVD um, set that I just managed to use. By the way, down here in Portland, we're having demonstrations, we're having, so here's the two TV set, and I, my last video is about that, you know, world headlines aspect of what's going on right now here in Portland. So if you're here to hear that, dial back one video, you'll get more of that place-based education. But this is my television. My mom watched this too. Uh, it, ha it does have subtitles. She's very hard of hearing. We watched it at different times, both Citizen Kane and on the next DVD besides this one, a whole long documentary about... This is my living room. That's from Lesotho. My parents were based in Africa sometimes. So that's a stirrup thing, or, or what do you call it when you put your foot next to a horse that you would maybe have like that, right? Those aren't from, some, from the same pair. But that would be like a ceremonial occasion. You see how the strap, the stirrup, comes down to the shoe here. I'm just, this is Glenn's collection, Great Octahedron. Okay, so let's do some more history. Just, just, that was very place-based there. Because really that was a segue, right? That's geometry that the, of the kind I do. The isotropic vector matrix, blah, blah, concentric hierarchy, the Bucky stuff. Of course that's got to be here, but we're not there yet, okay? But here we jump to it. That second video in the DVD set about Citizen Kane is about the battle royale between Orson Welles and Hearst, right? Randolph, William Randolph Hearst, right? Isn't that his full name? So that was before my time personally. Like Orson Welles and I overlap in time. I think Hearst was already passed away long before I was born, right? And I've gone by his castle, so-called, on the road, but I have not taken the tour up there to see it, actually. Anyway, just there we go. And so Wells is already important in my curriculum. Does anyone remember why? Raise your hand. Huh. Kind of a joke, because um, we're asynchronous. But uh, Wells, uh, he wrote, um, he didn't read. Well, he read online. He read 
on radio, which was online at the time, War of, War of the Worlds by another Wells, spelled differently, H.G. Wells, right? Great British author who we study also for his visit to New York that time for like the Parliament of World Peace. It wasn't called that exactly. And he's your man on the scene, your first person journalist, already got a big audience. And he comes to New York and we study that piece of writing. We study Orson Welles and we study that whole Martian uh, panic attack because Mars attacks and Mars and Martian math, that's a big, a big part of my curriculum, right? That's what I, one of my, what we're trademarked here uh, for, what people know us for, let's put it that way. So historian Gus Frederick is how I tie this to me because the Hearst Empire included a very effective political cartoonist named Homer Davenport. And Gus Frederick here, who's a wanderer, we meet in the Pauling House. Haven't seen him recently because we're still in the pandemic, right? So when you go back through this piece of history, this window of Orson Welles versus Hearst, and Citizen Kane, you come against the Spanish-American War, again, the whole Hearst time. McKinley, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, what happened in Cuba? So now we're starting to get to big-time history. What was the Anti-Imperialist Imperialist League? Mark Twain, Andrew Carnegie, right? So I'm, I'm expanding it out here, and that's a big chunk now. You'll agree. Now here's another puzzle piece Place-based, okay? Think about this. Place-based if you're in my area, but you can get here through some story. Columbia River Gorge, right? Missoula floods. We want to talk about that a lot and on different levels. And let me tell you some of the levels. For example, pioneering or, uh, let's see, development of high-quality paved roads. Not just, you know, the pavement is great, but the contours of the road, the grade of the road, uh, you know, how much it twists and turns, how much it destroys the landscape or not. You know, what's a great road, right? That You could say the Romans knew a lot about that, right? But having traveled in the Himalayas and stuff, like road engineering is something that humans have really, really, really worked on a lot, right? And when it comes to the Columbia Gorge, that was going to be a huge challenge. And who's pushing the roads there to get some quality European level roads into the Columbia Gorge? That's a man by the name of Sam Hill. And I mentioned him, I mentioned him not too long ago in a video relating to Sam Lanahan, a different Sam, right? So that's one of Stefan's videos, which I, I cite that in my last video too. If you want to if you want to follow those breadcrumbs to Sam Hill, because that's another important character. You can get him not through me, but just saying. Um, the the uh, faux Stonehenge that's out there by the Dalles and so on. Anyway, more Columbia Gorge lore there. And, and the whole dams, you know, Bonneville Dam and the tension with fishing and fish and what you're doing to the ecosystem with the dam. I'm not saying that in a heavy-handed, judgmental way. I'm saying it's something we want to study because Martian math also blends over into what? The Martians and Earthlings working together on a dam. Pure science fiction, implement it however you want. It's collaborative, so it could be not scary. It could be cute, right? If you're into, like, uh, anime and you want to do this cute, I'm not against it. I'm not telling you how it has to be done, but I'm suggesting Martians meet humans, make dams together, hydro dams, because we want to teach about electricity, including the high voltage stuff, direct uh, current versus alternating global grid. We're not just talking about, you know, how your house gets power or that's part of it, or not just what happens in your computer, but that's part of it. The whole motherboard from the sun on through the planet, everything. We want the big picture there. And of course, something the size of Columbia Gorge, it's starting to be more cosmic than it is, you know, kind of little human, right? It's starting to be big and real. You could just call it that, geological. So we hook history to geography is another way of saying it. Now, and of course, the Manhattan Project is going to come in here. We're going to talk about Hanford and stuff. So those are what I mean by chunks. See, and another one I'll throw by two more and call it like 
um, a pep talk again. I'm trying to excite teachers into how do we set up world history now, especially that we have got a lot going on the STEM side already, right? You've got understood how we bridge to STEM from the humanities, which is where we start philosophy and all that. So we've gone over the bridge, we've poked around in STEM, we've gone to Ramana John and done a lot with, uh, you know, our comedian honeycombs or whatever you want to call them. And now we're back here in the humanities again. It's, okay, let's get on with history, path, P-A-T-H, philosophy, anthropology, theater, and history. We're not in STEM, we're in path, right? And we're in history right now. So our Laurel Canyon would be another quote-unquote memeplex or complex as kind of the heart of the rock and roll story, you could say. And we'll do Jim Morrison and his dad, the Admiral, right? We're talking about kind of privileged kids, elites, like they're like Frank Zappa, who, who what was his parents into? Like these are people from Washington, D.C. area whose parents have had very high-level jobs. And, and for a reason there, therefore, for, for that reason, these kids are not really f scared by elites there because that's who they grew up with. And so they form the nucleus of a counterculture for a couple of reasons is what I'm saying. So analysis goes here. I'm not going to tell you everything that you should think, right? But read the uh, story of Laurel Canyon. So that's, you know, we're trying to get into contemporary times, and we're going to do that through Laurel Canyon, the Vietnam War, and where's my Fletcher Prouty? So we want to do, yeah, Introduction by Oliver Stone, right? They make fun of this, you know, they talk on Joe Rogan like this guy didn't exist. Joe Rogan's standard party line is like, well, I don't like Oliver Stone's movie because he makes up this guy who comes in out of the blue, right? The, uh, um, gosh, who plays him? You know who I mean. The same guy who plays Snow and famous actor we all like. The guy who plays Man X. You'll, I'll think of it later, right? I might even put it on the screen here. So, yeah, Laurel Canyon, another complex. And then in the World War II world, where we're going to bridge, like, from these people's parents back to, like, establishment D.C., you want to understand the deep state, quote-unquote. You want to understand World War II. And that, you got to get into eugenics, and you got to get back to Malthus, and you got to get back to, you know how people imagine they're fighting each other for scarce resources. And in what sense is that true? And in what sense is that a lie? Sometimes a made-up lie, right? Things are artificially made scarce, aren't they? So that brings us back to Buckminster Fuller. Here's a bibliography there. This guy was prolific, or stuff about him. And I've talked about him on... on so much already on my videos that I'm just going to go buy that one. And by the way, here's me, genealogy of the Erner family. Since we're talking history and place-based and stuff, I'll, I'll throw out the arm, the coat of arms, as they call it, or the logo of the Erners. This is a very old-looking version of it. Right, That's the Erners in the old days. I'll show you the earners in the modern day earner symbol some other time. And finally, let's talk about like racism and stuff. And let's do get into the American context. Like I always encourage if you're going to talk racism, explore it outside the United States also. Because what I find about Americans is because they've internalized that they're a superpower and they think and talk a lot, they think that now they should go out to the world like missionaries and teach us all this elaborate vocabulary and how we should think about same-sex relationships or race or all this stuff that we are melting pot, where we fight and debate and really take ourselves pretty seriously and then come up with some elaborate new concoction about racism or whatever and then go out there into the world sure that we have the thing everyone wants to learn and, and, and listen to. I think that's kind of super powery and I don't think those days are numbered I would think right. 
That being said, back to American history, because I am being place-based, so I don't mean to bore you to death if you're in Russia or whatever. And I'm talking like Civil War. But think in your context. In what way is Holy Scripture used to justify sort of a pyramid where there's little fewer at the top? Like, how do you justify the pyramid shape using religion? And do you do that? Is that part of it? Or, you know, just these kind of big questions. And here in this country, using the Bible to justify why certain people were masters and certain people were slaves, you know, to give that a religious explanation, to say, well, it's because of blah, blah, in the Bible, just read the Bible and blah, blah, blah. And so that is something we would study being Quaker school, right? So I'm thinking when I talk about a school, it's often flavored as a Quaker school. Partly because, yeah, I'm Quaker, but also because I think, again, as far as an entry to history and watching the train go by in a relativistic sense, watching the coordinate system of world history from a Quaker point of view, which is spun a certain way already, is a good access, it's a good way to read into the world. It's a good way to get in is to study the history of Quakers. So that's a thread I encourage, but I'm not going to go into here because I've already gone into what? Let's just review quickly. It's place-based. You're where you are. Let's say you are in Russia. You know, you can easily jump to Hearst because he had an agenda vis-a-vis -vis Russia. He had opinions on everything, and he was going to rule the world from his, according to his, you know, he was a king. You can't say anything less. Khan, Citizen Khan, right? So Hearst had an agenda towards Russia. So you can jump into this whole chunk from Russia. What if you're in Uruguay, right? Well, Theodore Roosevelt, the, the whole the Monroe, doc, just think about how El Norte has been very, like, imperial, right? It's, this is our hemisphere. Now, who's this we? We're going to take it away from the people here, declare it ours. We're even going to buy it from Napoleon, who's never even been here, right? like Jefferson is going to buy the Louisiana Purchase from Napoleon. How does that work, right? And we're supposed to believe white man law. Of course, it's enforced at gunpoint, not by logic. There is no logic. It's just, oh, yeah, we're white people. We own the place. Duh. Now, how do you justify that? Well, you need books that have a holy, a holy feel to them, like the Bible and stuff. And people have to take that seriously. And if you don't have that... You have to resort to something else that's authority, like mathematics. Something that has that built for the ages, gabon, you can't argue with this, that kind of thing, right? Okay, so we covered that and how we can do Columbia Gorge, and then coming up on our own time with the wars that we've had, starting with the Spanish American, let's say, and the anti when when America tipped the United States from being, well, it never did. It kind of uh, manifest destiny. Let's throw that in as the final unifying concept here. Let's talk about it. Let's let's get clear about how come Americans, even after they're coast to coast and have the United States all the way up to California from Vermont and stuff, now they have to keep going and Hawaii becomes theirs and the Philippines becomes theirs. And you're saying, well, that's history. The Philippines is free and independent now. Okay, fine. Uh, but just let's study the history because we're doing the Hearst, Homer Davenport, right? Let's study American imperialism as one of many empires, right? One of many, okay? It's not, it's like we can talk about the Roman Empire now. I think it's long enough ago that it's like we're not like boiling mad. Maybe we are. But when I talk about American imperialism, it all happened a long time ago. Do a, do a Star Wars for me. Don't worry about if it's a good or bad thing right now, right? We're just kind of taking in what's so. It's more interesting than judgment. Not that you can't judge, but it can get in the way. All right. That's our pep talk for today. Have yourselves a fine rest of the week.